Good morning, everyone. It is lovely to see you here. My name is Maxine McHugh, and it's a pleasure for me to be here today as your host for this Learning Environments Regional Day Out, which is looking at the inner urban learning environments. This is just a lovely day and a beautiful day for the treat you're in for this afternoon because you're either going to walk or take the tram to the various site visits that uh, we've got organised and ending up at the brilliantly designed South Melbourne Primary School, uh, which is uh, Melbourne's first vertical school. I'm very proud in particular of this one because it's in my neighbourhood, just a few streets down from where I live. And as you'll find, it's a superb way of rethinking spaces for education. We're now going to move to our, our keynote and uh, Derek Scott um, has agreed to, uh, to deliver this uh, uh, for us today. Now, Derek is operating across borders, and I mean across international borders. He, of course, is the CEO principal of Halleberry, which is Australia's largest school and the recipient of the 2018 Australian School of the Year Award. He's over overseeing uh, right now four operations in Melbourne, of course, one in the, in the city. Um, he has a school in Darwin, uh, in Tianjin province uh, in China, and uh, also operations in Timor-Leste and in Manila. So please welcome Derek Scott. Thank you, Maxine, and uh, thank you, everyone. It's wonderful uh, to be here. I've got to correct Maxine, and I'm really sorry to have to correct someone who's in the Media Hall of Fame now as well. But uh, when she referred to the fabulous South Melbourne School, and congratulations, Richard. Richard knows what's coming here, I think, as the first vertical school in Victoria. It took me three months to get the Education Minister to refer to it as the first vertical state school in Victoria, because Halebury, in fact, was the first vertical school in Victoria. And I was at a, at a function earlier in the week with, with James and he stood up to speak and he started to speak and he said, and I've got to get this right because Derek's here, it's the first vertical state school in Victoria, so the language is now coming through. But uh, it's a fabulous, South Melbourne is of course a wonderful project and great to see that recognition of, of architecture um, in education in Victoria coming across. And I wanted to acknowledge uh, right at the start today that a lot of what I will show you uh, both for us here in Victoria, but also everything we've done, and including in China, is the result of a great collaboration with Darren Carnell, architects. Darren's here. Where are you, Darren? You're sitting, um, yeah, Darren's here. Um, Darren has worked with us for 10 years on most of our Halebury projects, and it's one of those uh, partnerships that you want to have as an educator, and if you're looking at new opportunities with an architect, where it's a real um, discussion and collaboration that works together, and where he brings your staff along on that journey with them as well. And I'm very appreciative of the, the 10 years of work that we've had together um, on a lot of really interesting, interesting projects. So Halebury is indeed Australia's largest school and indeed it's Australia's School of the Year and that's one of those awards, um, if you don't win it of course, it's all very dodgy and the judges are all you know, somewhere offside. If you do win it, it's all very prestigious and above board and fantastic. So that's how, that's how our marketing people have taken it anyway. But of course, it is a, a nice recognition for, um, for all of the hard work that we've done on a, on a great range of projects. And we've got uh, campuses. Our first campus was at Brighton, 1892. Uh, moved to have a Keysborough campus in 1962 with some of the growth uh, through Melbourne, then out to Berwick in 1989. So, you know, before my time, there was still a history of the school looking for opportunities and development in different ways. Um, and then we opened, we actually opened the China campus in 2013 at Halebury International School Tianjin, which is about 45 minutes out of Beijing. So it's in Tianjin province rather than city, but just out of Beijing. Uh, and that is a boarding school for uh, now 900 Chinese students from year one to year 12, delivering the Chinese national curriculum through to year nine and then delivering the Victorian Certificate of Education through year 10, 11, 12, a fascinating project. Uh, and then we opened the city campus in, uh, what are we, in 2017 or 2016, we opened the ELC and, uh, as, a, as a, just a, a starting point for it, and then the rest of it, 2017. And then we did an acquisition and um, uh, takeover and opened in January this year, Halebury Rendell School in Darwin, which incorporates also the largest indigenous boarding school uh, in Australia, and, uh, and we're building that up to 150 uh, Indigenous borders, and that's an, an absolutely extraordinary project on a, on a number of levels, and I know, again, Darren spent time up there on a pro bono basis for us, working on transforming what was a very tired and outdated Indigenous boarding house with, and he collaborated with the Indigenous students on what that framework would look like for them, and the students who've come into that this year have been so excited 
to have the facilities that they have there um, and, and really you know, proud of being a part of that school. So there's a lot of projects um, on the go, as you can see. And um, I do recall saying, uh, when I took over 10 years ago and looking at, we didn't have all of those sites then, and, and looking at the architecture, and my saying then was, well, the one uh, unifying feature of our architecture is that there is no unifying feature of our architecture. So we actually did start a process back then of saying, well, let's have some notion of people walking onto a Haleybury campus and understanding uh, that it is a Haleybury campus. And that came largely through the refitting of many of our classrooms and spaces and the colours and the, the textures and the sort of things that Darren brought to it. And you would now, not from the external features, but you would now from walking through any Halebury campus anywhere in the world, you would identify it as a Halebury site and you'd feel a part of that Halebury community. And that, that includes in Tianjin, where the, the core of the building was already built before we came on board with the project, but the internal fit out reflects very much that, that Halebury um, component. And then uh, I was asked, as you said at the late last moment, to speak after Alastair couldn't make it, but I had a look at his brief and I largely thought most of what he had in there was something that I could comment upon in the context of our own vertical school project, the one that we've done here in Melbourne. And uh, so I will largely follow that through and have a talk about some of the population aspects talk about some of, the, some of the financial elements to it because I think it's interesting to think of different ways we can look at that financially and our project is a retrofit of a 30 year old building as distinct from a purpose build from the ground up through there and there's both some interesting financial economies around that as well as uh, some benefits and some constraints around that as well. The general notion of vertical schools, a couple of the challenges along the way and I think what are a whole set of opportunities for us involved in education design and building in the future. And this, of course, is our vertical school project. And someone said to me the other day, a principal, he said, oh, it's obvious that project would work. Um, I can't tell you, it didn't always feel obvious because um, it was a first for Melbourne. No one had done it before. And there was a particular weekend when I remember it didn't feel obvious. And that was the weekend after we had, uh, well, sometime after, we'd purchased the building for $52.5 million. Um, we didn't have permission to run a school because, of course, that all had to go through the uh, convoluted process and the complications of Melbourne City Council and all the different dynamics of the council uh, through there. We didn't have a single enrolment. And uh, the first run that had come back from the, uh, from the pricing on, on Darren's first run of the architecture was, was uh, three times over the budget. So I remember doing a lot of laps of the Oval watching my son play football that morning and thinking, you know, how do we pull that together? Um, how do we make it go from here? Um, and in the way that you do on a project like this, you decide what you can do yourself and you decide where you need help and you get the best people on board to help you with that. I knew I'm, I'm pretty good at politics for a variety of ways, so I knew I could do the politics and I could take charge of that and get that done. I knew we could work with Darren on, on getting the pricing down to a point where we could make it work. And Darren and I, I think in the week after that, did a work right through the building. We went from the bottom to the top and said, where do we cut? Where do we go? How do we make it? And we did some really interesting things that you'll see. You know, we looked at carpet tiles and Darren said, well, we can put a feature through there, but we don't need to change all of these. We looked at ceiling tiles and said, well, you know, we can strip these back and make them black or we can leave the good ones in there. Whole range of areas which took millions of dollars off the project and brought it back to budget and no one would notice when they walked through today, they would see it as, you know, a really interesting feature. So it was an interesting way in that notion of retrofitting a building and doing it to a budget of working with a budget and with an architect together on that sort of project as well. And we got a good marketing team, so we got them onto it. And it is great that people see it that way now, that it was obvious that it would work. That's what you want them to say through it. But, you know, when you do something new, when you take on a new project or when you want to, and you would all have seen that in your own fields, when you want to create something that people haven't done before, it does take um, an element of courage to stick with it, to go through it and to always maintain that confidence with people that it will work. By the time we'd got to that point, um, I had done, uh, what, three or four years of work on this already. Back in 2011, the 2011 census data came out and I had a, I had a, a good look at that data uh, and it was clear, the trends in Melbourne were clear, I think we already had in that century up those 11 years from 2000 to 2011, something like another 700,000 people in Melbourne, I think since 2011 to 2017, I think we've now added another 800,000 people in Melbourne. So there's extraordinary growth in Melbourne. We also, if you look at that sort of data, the, the growth in Melbourne today is 38% of the, the residents of Melbourne were born overseas. 
Um, and a lot of those, of course, were born in Southeast Asia, and a lot of those are very familiar with the notions of vertical schools and things as well. So I did a close track of the 2006 and 2011 census data in some key areas, and what came clear to me was that the trend was pretty good in terms of, um, from a very small base, admittedly, in terms of families with children living in the city or living in the CBD and surrounding regions. Admittedly, it dropped off after the four, so there was a big growth in zero to four, from five, uh, you know, from five to nine, it dropped away. Why did it drop away? It dropped away because most people moved out from then, in many cases, because they couldn't, didn't have a school nearby to go to as well. Um, so that was the basic data that I started with, and then we went to look at KPMG, and I will show you some KPMG data shortly on that. We, I got them to do a research paper for me, and that was then Bernard Salt's unit, through to 2031, to have a look at what their projected trends would be based on that. Um, but we, so, I'll, and I'll actually I'll go to that now, and I'll come back to this slide in a minute. So some of that trend data is, is this is some of the KPMG data from the report that they did for us. So you can see here on this side here, we've got the 2011 data and the 2013 data. So 2011, you can see the lighter colours through there basically are, uh, if we're looking at, the, as they move to a darker shade, include the increase in students or children, sorry, aged 5 to 19 years, or as my finance people call them, revenue streams, but from 5 to 19 years. Um, I don't let that out very often, but... Um, <laughs> Very important to look after revenue streams. Um, so, and you can see in basic trends, this inner city area of Melbourne, the darker area through, just through, just out, just on the edge of the CBD thread, the, the, the big growth in the student population projected through that 2011 to 2013 years. And uh, that growth has been confirmed by the 2016 census data that's come through as well. Um, then we have the absolute change in population age 5 to 19 years old in that time and again you can see uh, some significant growth in that age and the inner Melbourne 5 to 19 year age group anticipated to increase by 61% in that period through there. Now of course remembering that Halebury is a high fee school um, and uh, so therefore there's only a percentage of that that would, would in a sense come to Halebury through there so we also needed to look at what that data was like in terms of, uh, in terms of income etc. Uh, and so, again, some more growth data through there, and you can see some of the absolute figures and some of the pretty extraordinary percentage growth in, in, in uh, figures through there for areas such as Melbourne, South Bank, Docklands, Remainder, West Melbourne, which is really interesting because, of course, that's where we ended up, a little bit in, in the West Melbourne region through there, and that's the whole inner region through there. So, uh, off a low base, but really extraordinary percentage growth projected. From that, we then gave us enough confidence to say, okay, we can look at a school of 800 students, we can probably afford a spend of around $75 million on a school of 800 students, that would be the, the sort of basics of a business proposition for us to make that work. Where's the best location? I must admit, when I started this process, I was quite keen on a location uh, further down towards, I guess, Flinders Street down through there on the transport hub. Uh, and in fact, we did look at, we did a lot of work, we did about uh, nine months of work, uh, including some architecture work on building on top of uh, just the area through here, which is a DEXIS project that they've got through there, on the, on Flind which backs onto both Flinders Street or, and backs onto Flinders Lane as well. We had a good look at that project. That was building a school on top of a car park through there. Really interesting proposal. We got some design elements up, but basically couldn't bring the project in down to the sort of financial figures where it was going to work. We then looked at Docklands um, and, and uh, the good sheds down at Docklands. And you, the good sheds down at Docklands, of course, are a really interesting set of buildings through there. The historic buildings, they've been fully upgraded. And we actually bid on that and we were the underbidder on that. That would have been a really interesting um, project for us. The biggest challenge, the building was great, um, would have been a really good conversion to a school uh, through there. And it was already a good fit out, so it was a really easy conversion in many ways. The problem we would have had with that one was the recreation space, which was a bit challenged. And in fact, we were in discussions with Melbourne City Council at one point about whether we might be able to use that really interesting space that's actually under the Collins Street overpass as an outdoor recreation space as well through there. So that was really trying to reconceptualise some of the things that might, 
might go with a city campus through there as well. Of course, Eltham College had their, their project in King Street, which was the first sort of city school that was ever started and didn't work, but it was still an interesting building there, although it was a little bit, and they, they closed. So that was the only other example we had of a vertical, or not of a, of a city school in Melbourne, was one that hadn't worked, and they closed because they, they, for a range of reasons, but I don't think the building was quite right for that. Um, we also talked uh, with the uh, Uniting Church pretty extensively about their big development, which I think is, where is that? That's up in, um, is it up in Trobe Street, I think it was. And so they've got a big development through there and whether we could tie that in. And there was an, that was an interesting site because it also had the oldest school building, and the original school building in Melbourne was on that site as well. Uh, and for a variety of reasons, we couldn't quite get that over the line. So we looked at these, and as I tell the, the kids at the city campus now, when I talk to them, you know, one of the key things in any interesting, enterprising, entrepreneurial project is, is you know, doing the groundwork, but it's perseverance and persistence. And I tell them, the only reason you got this building is because I failed four times. And we learned from each failure and we kept coming back and kept having a look at what we might be able to do. So that was, you know, a three, four year process having a look through, through all of that. And then this site came on the market up here, which was um, the, uh, a former NAB 10 story, former NAB... Uh, call centre. Uh, the call centre moved down to Docklands. Uh, so the NAB building, uh, they'd moved out a couple of years before. It was owned by a uh, Singaporean billionaire who's done a quite a bit of development in Melbourne, We Sing Co. And I must say, from the moment we walked through this building, uh, you just knew it was the right building for a school. Initially, I was a little bit worried about being a little bit far west, whether that wouldn't suit us. As it turns out, this is the best site for a school in Melbourne, for a high fee school in Melbourne. In part because you've got the medical precinct just a little bit further to the north. And of course you've got a whole lot of professional families living in that area with both the university and the medical precinct. And these days, um, you know, doctors hook up with other doctors and have one kid and then when they get to, and they're living in Kensington or West Melbourne and then they used to have to, you know, send them across to school the other side of town or move, which is what they often did. We've actually talked to a lot of families in that thing have said, well, we'll, we'll do some renovations on our house, we'll stay here and we'll send the kid through there as well. So it, it was actually a really good location for a whole range of reasons through there. But also in terms of this building had uh, two great terraces on, on levels, uh, I think three and four as they are, a pretty big rooftop space which is at this moment undergoing the process of conversion through there and directly opposite Flagstaff Gardens. And so from my point of view as we look at the great success of the project now and the project I think we've got about 450 students there this year we'll have just under 600 next year and it'll be at capacity at 800 in two years time and that's because we've gone up to uh, year 10 this year then we go to year 11 and year 12 the year after junior school completely full with with huge waiting lists middle school the year levels we've opened completely full as well so the demand has been just massive for it through there when I look at the project now, though, I, it, it's one of those things that you, you're just very pleased that all of the others fell over because this one with the Flagstaff Gardens opposite it, the Flagstaff Gardens has really been the point that has, has given us an extra dimension to what, how a vertical school really can work and, and how it can feel because basically every classroom, every teaching space, learning space inside this building from level three up overlooks the green of the park and the trees. So it's actually, you know, which you could go to any of our campuses and the best outlook from out of your, your, your classroom or teaching space is going to be in this building here. So it's a fabulous site. It feels great because of the look that it's got through there and also it's just great to have that access across um, through that. Interesting, uh, just following on from the demographic component through there, and this is... Uh, and I asked James's people, James Miller's people, to send me just this through. Um, they sent it through last night for me, just so I could, you know, what the Labor government, if they get back in, of course, have projected: 90,000 growth in students between now and 2022, 100 new government schools they're aiming to build over an eight-year period, uh, 45 schools between 2019 and 2022, 55 schools between 2023 and 26. Of course, at the moment, two of those, the South Melbourne School, and the uh, Richmond School are the two that are inner city schools that they're developing through there. But you look at those figures, 90,000 new students, and if, if you take into account that uh, just over a third of all students, 35% of all students in Victoria, 
Uh, it's about 30% of primary and 40% of secondary students go to independent or Catholic schools. That's just the government school build that they've got to do as well. You've got roughly a third of that that has to happen on the independent and Catholic school side to cater for this growth in students if those, if those numbers of people moving across are going to be the same through there. So it's a really interesting one and you would have to suggest that some of that will have to come into the vertical school notion. But even, you know, it's interesting about reconceptualising what it means for schools in some of your growth, growth corridors as well. Do you want them to be around a central community hub which includes, you know, the shopping area and everything else rather than on its own greenfield site a little bit further out than that. Now, I'll give you an example. I'll finish today with an example from Guangzhou and a project we've got there which is, is, a, is a really interesting vertical um, school as well. So that growth is there, so it's really interesting to think about all of the elements that we have today through it. And I guess this was just some other data there which I mentioned previously, which was the income data that shows some of the projections uh, and that in Melbourne remainder there were almost 1,000 couples, families with children earning a high income which represented the 30% of the total families. That was the other part of our equation for doing the sort of school that we have that we needed to be, be sure of. So this data is around, you can get it quite detailed and granulated. So that's why I was relatively confident in the concept and in the potential demand when you combined all of that with 38% of families in Melbourne being born overseas and of those roughly half being born in Southeast Asia the notion of what a vertical school would look like and obviously we've done, I've done 15 years of work in China and in other parts of Asia. Um, but that doesn't mean it's actually going to work and that was just the summary of all of the, the data um, that we used through there. And I think that summary still applies because of course we have seen the 2011 now, 2018, most of, if I look at most of the projections on that KPMG data they are coming true in terms of Melbourne's population, Melbourne's young people population and the 90,000 new students there also um, projected by the government as well. So, we purchased the building for 52.5 million. Um, took a few, few, few months, of, or a few, actually it wasn't months, it was a few weeks of hard work to try and get that through and um, at the last minute, uh, kind of a whole lot of hurdles came up and partly, uh, and it's good to be in a room where there probably aren't many lawyers, all the lawyers and real estate agents were getting in the way, so I thought, um, as a Singaporean billionaire, I thought I'm going I'm to have to call him direct and see if we can get this deal over the line. So it was Wee Seng Ko, so I called him on a Sunday morning on his mobile in Singapore and I just read in Fortune magazine that he was worth 2.7 billion US dollars and was the fourth wealthiest man in Singapore. So I, I'm never one to die wondering about things, so I, I called him, I said, Wee Seng, we're going to talk about this city building if we can get it over the line in Melbourne. I said we should be able to sort it out businessman to businessman because between us we're worth 2.7 billion dollars. <laughs> Dead silence on the end of the phone. I thought that's buggered it. <laughs> and then there was a little chuckle and he said okay let's talk. <laughs> and in the classic way that these things do, it, it came down to that extra $500,000 and him having a win basically as you know as it often happens on with real estate people through there. So that, that was, uh, you know, it was a high price. The building had previously been sold, I think, uh, to him four years earlier for 40 million, but that's the sort of growth that had been occurring through Melbourne, so he did get a good deal of it. They, they had been rejected on that building, by the way, uh, for a full um, uh, residential development, and that's why it sort of came back on, on the market, as it were. Um, and, but we would project, we've had extraordinary growth since we bought it in 2000. 15, uh, you know, our growth is probably somewhere in the area of 20 to 25 percent on the value of that, the land and the, the building through there as well, so that's been good. The fit out, we wanted to get the fit out done. Um, uh, you know, we, as I said, the whole project, we really needed to make a $75 million project, so that, that's where the fit out comes in through there, and I've explained a little bit of how we work through that with Darren. The, the planning of planning for 800 students. Um, and, and the planning was that fascinating process. So we had to go to Melbourne City Council, of course, and we had to get permission to run a school there. And it was, we really couldn't find out when the last time Melbourne City Council had been presented with permission to run a school. We'd done a lot of work over a number of years with the then Lord Mayor, Robert Doyle, who was the Lord Mayor through this process, and he was on side. So he had his, his team of largely five votes that we had to support the process. So, but we also, of course, wanted to get uh, make sure that we got the nominal uh, Labor people on side there as well, and also the Greens. Um, and we also wanted to commit to a process that, or to a building that, that, that didn't 
contribute to Melbourne's congestion and other issues. We wanted public transport to be a key. One of the things for that that we talked to the Greens on the Council about and what we've got in place for our staff is that, because if you think of our, our Keysborough, Brighton and Berwick campuses, all of our staff basically have parking on site but those um, for, their, for their driving to work. Uh, but we weren't going to, even though there's two levels of car parks on this site, we didn't want that. So we, all of our staff at the city campus get a free Mikey card each year for that and are expected to come by public transport to and from school through there. And that was part of the notion of, uh, you know, was getting green support, but it was part of the notion of what we wanted to do with this project as well. We did have, um, uh, we got the council, the council officers were great, they were right on side because they, there'd been, there's obviously been a lot of articles even leading up to this about the notion of the lack of services in Melbourne and that was the lack of community services, the lack of schools, all that sort of thing. So they were very good at working through with us on the project. Um, and we fit it in with the, you know, the design elements for, for the region, uh, for the area as well. Um, we did have about 56 objectors, which was a lot, of course, to go through there, although a lot of them were, you know, had been run through some of the apartment buildings nearby and sort of just photocopied through there. We did have an objectors meeting, was about 40 people turned up. I got more advice at that objectors meeting about how to run a school than I've had in 20 years of actually running a school. It was fabulous. <laughs> so what about the bells? They'll keep us awake. We're not using bells. But you can't run a school without bells. <laughs> so it was all these fabulous things, things like this that, that came back at us. But, you know, most of the people were well-meaning, just wanted to know about it and, and see, uh, you know, how the... Pro and it had, had understandable things about their own amenity of their living conditions. Um, so it, 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 in, the, in the end, it went to council uh, with, with the support of the council officers and it gained uh, the full support, the full vote of the council, which included the, uh, the five Liberals, the four nominal Labor, a couple of Greens and a couple of Independents. So uh, I'm considering that my greatest political achievement of pulling all of that grit together to vote on the, the project um, that way. Um, there was a funny moment, though, because I left... Uh, no, in fact, it's on the record there that Robert Doyle at that meeting said, Derek, this is a fantastic project. And I have to tell you, in all my time as Lord Mayor, I've never had a project where we've had 56 objectors and then no one has turned up to object uh, at the meeting. And that's a full credit to you and your team. And then, uh, and well done. So I've got that. I've actually got the audio of that on the record, which I've given to our archives people. Um, about a few days later, we hadn't got the notice of decision and we rang them up and said, can we have the notice of decision? And, I said, oh, and they said, yeah, oh, we've got a problem. And they said, what's that? We said, we're, we're not sure we notified the objectors of the meeting. <laughs> <laughs> I don't care. That's on the record now as far as I'm concerned of the great work and collaboration that we did to get that project through. Um, and the other part, which is an interesting one through here, because a key to this, and this is one of the early sort of design diagrams, is a pedestrian crossing that we've got across through here, which goes across to the park. Um, we were due to open the school at the start of last year. That was the, the primary school and middle school. The, the permit that we had from Melbourne City Council uh, wouldn't allow us to open the school until we had the pedestrian crossing in place. We ha and that's a pedestrian full light crossing everything. We had all of that work done um, by basically by the middle of the year uh, and that Vic roads were fantastic. We got the approval, we got it all done, we got the, resealed the road, had the lights in. Um, 23rd of December, the, the planning project manager came and said, City Power, they've called us again, they said they're not going to get the lights done, the electricity to the lights. Now, I don't know how many of you have dealt with City, there's no one from City Power here, is there? <laughs> now, it is being recorded though, so I've got to be a little bit careful. City Power weren't very good, let's put it that way, for a whole range of reasons. And I do think it's an interesting one in terms of the development of our facilities, you know, when you, you do have uh, significant... Um, you know, companies, power companies that are held offshore, making a good return, but not particularly interested in developing new assets for community use in that sense, because there's not necessarily a great return in that. And I know I've discussed with, with councillors and politicians around, they're all, many of them are equally frustrated about that notion, because this is a four hour job to hook, hook up the power to these lights. And on the 23rd of December, we were told it wasn't going to be done and couldn't be done because there's a whole lot of paperwork had gone missing and it was going to take another three to four months. So. I've been working in China for 15 years. I know there's a workaround somewhere. So between Christmas and you, and we did, so I got the lawyers onto it. We discovered that you could, in fact, uh, there was a ministerial order which said if you had the permission of the relevant authority, which is Vic Roads, then you could attach your own power source to it. 
for a temporary power supply, which is an interesting one to note for any of you if you've got your projects going through that relate to a school or another facility. Did two trips out to Sunshine to meet with very helpful Vic Roads people. We got that permission. And so basically, for about the first three months of this school, it looked like something out of the back streets of Calcutta or New Delhi with a power cord coming out here attached to the top of the traffic lights. But we got it open and we got it running on time through there. So I, I, all of you in planning, I'm sure, and, and in design elements, I'm sure you all have your own stories around those sort of things. But it is frustrating when you, you really are, of course, pushing things through. Um, interesting to think about in terms of the overall development, 13,000 square metre building, 800 students, two outdoor recreation spaces on three and four and a rooftop outdoor recreation space as well. Total cost around 75 million. Um, it's an interesting one to think about in terms of, you know, Richard, be able to tell you the cost of the, the South Melbourne, the bill cost of the school, and that doesn't, I don't know what, the, what that land would be worth itself from the government. But it's an interesting one to think about if you find the right building and repurpose it, and really this has been a fabulous building to repurpose as to whether there's a better value proposition cost per student than if you're actually uh, doing a, a cost from build up. Um, of course, there are compromises along the way with that, but it's worked very well for us. The building itself, the general flow of the building through there, there are car parks. This lower level we've still kept as a, as a, uh, you know, as a pay community car park and we'll, we're still trying to figure out what we might do with that in an education sense down the track. Um, and we didn't want to play around too much with the building because there was always the notion what if the project doesn't work and what's your, what's your exit point? Well your exit point is to you know, sell it back as a, as a business building or whatever. Um, so this level, this is now, the, the car park level is the drop off and pick up for our ELC and our ELC, our early learning centre is up here. So parents have a park briefly, drop their kid, uh, they have, because in ELC you have to sign in your kid in and out, so there's enough space there for the early learning centre for the parents to go up and the lift sign their kid in and out. For the junior school parents, they can drop their kid off and there's a staff member who waits for three or four kids and then takes them through into the lift and up. Although, what we have been pleased about, of course, is that the vast majority of our junior school students walk to the school with their parents and are, in fact, from around that local community area as well. Um, so that has, you know, we, we were interested to see whether that space would work and it's worked incredibly effectively. Ground floor is then a, a range of facilities, big spaces uh, through, to be, and, uh, through to a cafe area through there and a library area and a reception area. That's not fully activated in the sense yet I've always had the vision that that ground floor space, a couple of those spaces, would be really activated when our year 11 and 12s were fully there because you want to see it like a university space with them coming in and out of the building, using what is a, an outdoor, a, a, a cafe for the public as well, but being fully, so that will be fully activated in a sense in the next couple of years. Um, and then we go up through, uh, through a, an art, music, drama floor, a really big floor through here, which is art, music, drama, which was a great floor, and I'll show you some of the pictures of that. Darren's done a fantastic job on that. Through to our junior school, up to our, um, so this is our ELC and a staff floor and a recreation floor here, and I'll show you a couple of pictures of that. And then we've got a junior school floor through here, and then we're up through the middle school, which is now all fully activated through there, the middle school. And these last couple of floors are being fitted out now as we move up this, have the senior school component through there. Um, we wanted a lot of big open spaces for people to look at because the notion in Melbourne of a school in its vertical building was always going to be where you come in and and, and expecting little boxes. So those ground floors, which are big, uh, what are they, 2,000 square metre floor plates, because it's a 2,000 square metre land that we've got is there. So people come in and are quite blown away by the size, the openness of the spaces they see on those first three floors. This is one of the floors that half of that 1,000 square metres of recreation space, running track, little games area, things through that. You've got to be creative. I like the fact that it's not a traditional gym in that sense. It makes your PE people and your sports people and your, your activity people rethink about the way they've got to go. You can't just do what they've always done, you know. Um, so that's been, that's been a really good space. We're really pleased with the way that that's, that's worked. There's some Sally Pearsons of the future coming through, I think. Um, and, and, you know, obviously it's great for a whole lot of sort of contemporary... Um, I guess, health and wellness activities that we'd like to see. Part of the drama floor here, again, some big spaces on the lower floor. Great fit out. Uh, Darren and his team have done a fabulous job on the, the decals. I love those across all of our campuses that we have through there. They just add a, a, a dimension to things, which is great. And we put a fair bit of effort and resources into this because we wanted music down one end, 
art down the other, drama, dance, theatre spaces in the middle through there, art through there, and then up to our ELC, and our ELCs are really thriving and we really need to expand those. And we are, this project has been so successful, I'm about to sign a 99-year lease on a property nearby so that we can double the size of our ELC in junior school and add some more recreation space as well. All through the ELC, the great outlook over Melbourne through there, junior school, and this is what I mean about these classrooms. You know, every classroom is looking out over the trees. It's got a beautiful outlook, uh, so you're not looking at a grey building next door, and I think that's a really important part of it. Um, through to some of the communal junior school spaces which flow through the building with the, the, the classrooms. Lots of glass. I always, and all the classrooms are glass, and we've, we've done a lot of retrofitting of 1960s buildings on all of our other campuses and opening them up with glass. The great tragedy of education design for me is a friend of mine in Boston who spent, who built the most expensive public school ever from funds raised, obviously you raise them from local taxes in Boston, $110 million on a school and the only outward looking component you can have from a classroom is one glass window in the door because, and that's got to have the steel shutter on it for the fear of, you know, shooting and things like that. It's just such a tragedy, isn't it? The whole notion of even what that does to education when we're opening everything up for people to move and see and flow through and, and keep everyone accountable. So these are really good spaces. All the furnishings, you know, we're on a tight budget. It's all been done really, really well through there. And again, you get these great communal spaces. That flows into the outdoor, one at the outdoor terrace on level four. Um, interesting sort of furnishings through there. I was talking with Darren about this just before because we put a lot of effort into some of the furnishings through there. And, and we've, as he's fitted out the next two floors, a lot of the furnishings are fixed on the next two floors because one of the things with all this sort of interesting stuff is teachers and still tend to push them into their own spaces, which we don't, when sometimes we're trying to get the teachers to reconceptualise what they're doing and they want to push it into the spaces where they keep doing what they've always been doing. So uh, I think Darren's done a great job on the next two floors for us around that. Key areas through the middle school, we, we couldn't put sort of walk, uh, stair, internal stairs like this through the, on every floor, but we've done it through some of the key floors that we wanted. Otherwise, the students use the the stairs that were there previously, which are pretty narrow, but there's one set that goes up and one set that comes down, and it's worked really effectively so far. Outdoor terrace, so this is junior middle school, use this for recreation space, the ELC terrace below. These terraces have been fabulous. They're really uh, just nice places to be, and again, you get the fabulous outlook over the park and over, over Melbourne. Um, science floor through there. I'll show you some interesting things, lessons we've learned from science in, in uh, China at a moment, I'll show you a little bit of that. And this top floor, which we've largely kept open, has become the community hub for the whole school, for our alumni network, for all of our events. It looks over Melbourne, you can have fabulous evening events, community events. So this has added another dimension to our whole school with all of the campuses and all of the, um, you know, the large, we've got an alumni network of 20,000 students and their contribution to it. And we use it for a lot of seminars for, for our work. We've got an institute which does a lot of work on explicit teaching around the country. We were going to look at the rooftop recreation and gym area, but we haven't done that and won't need to do that now that we've, we've got this extra space coming on board. Um, and I know I'm getting tight for time now, aren't I? So I'll just quickly go to our last thing. China, obviously, uh, has been a great project for us, and I just, I'll just show you some of the, the recognition of, I guess, uh, uh, the colours and things through there that were very much the lockers, the things through there that Darren added through for us in China, which, which make it recognisable as a Haleybury campus. That's our full campus. But a new project which is of interest to today's discussion, I think, is one that just opened a month ago in Guangzhou. Uh, it's, it's not a full joint venture project like we've got in, in Tianjin, it's, it's, a, um, it's more of an IP arrangement and a service delivery model. It's called Misha Academy by Halebury. And this is it. Um, so these floors here uh, is the school above a uh, shopping centre, which is, that was during the construction phase through there. The construction centre there, school up the top through there. Fabulous set of facilities. Uh, this, is a, this is a year uh, 9 to 12 school delivering the VCE um, and really interesting space. Guangzhou's been a totally reimagined city, of course, and it's a, it's a fabulous place to visit, I'm sure, if you're in architecture. This was the official getting set up for the official opening. So on that floor itself, you can see the running track going around the school, the classroom buildings up above that. So that you know, running track is on the top of the office and, and um, community buildings through there. Um, and very interesting sort of spaces uh, and uh, the opening wasn't 
done by half measures either, but you know, all the talk in China at the moment is around maker spaces, creativity, reimagining education. You know, they're not taking the focus off the great core skills development that they do, but there's so much talk around this there that any, you know, anything you're doing in China has to really include really strong elements. Well, I have more students at Hailey International School Tianjin doing art than I do in Melbourne. Um, you know, it's, it's such a popular part of students craving that creative outlook in China. A little mini golf course, uh, little interesting sort of robotic spaces through there. And then a really interesting cl science classroom as well. There's been no expense spared through there. So it's interesting ideas around what that, can, what that can look like. So, you know, we're trying to learn from everyone as we go around and look at, you know, some of the great facilities that are out there in schools. So the future, really, f I think... Um, you can create really interesting spaces in vertical schools. I think the outlook for students from those spaces, you know, the greenery is what's been a huge part of this project. The capacity for our students to engage with the city, and I haven't gone into the curriculum developments or things around that, is just fantastic. But we have students from all of our campuses coming into Melbourne to be a part of engagement in a whole range of services through the committee. The linking of, of that with, I guess, some of the social services for disadvantaged people and, and homeless, et cetera, is something that our city campus are always um, thinking about as well. Um, but for me, it's an exciting concept. I don't think it's anything to be afraid of. I remember John Fain, when we first announced this project, absolutely bagging it. You know, couldn't conceptualise why, how you could possibly have a school like that would work with when it didn't have five acres of grass around it or whatever. It can work. The kids love it. They really love it. Their satisfaction surveys from the students uh, this year have just been huge and they love the site, they love the excitement, they love the interest that it has around it. Of course there are things you've got to work with but it's been a great project. We've worked with a lot of good people on it and um, wish you good luck with all of your projects as well.